Hi, John. Hi, and welcome to Aarhus. Thank you. Um, being the lead singer of uh, Yes, mm -hmm. going to uh, perform three classic albums in Aarhus tomorrow. And that's going to be great, I think. Should be. Yeah. Apart from that, you just recorded a new album, uh, yes. which will be coming out in July, I think. Mm -hmm. um, before we talk about that, could you uh, explain to me how your Yes experience started? When were you first aware of Yes music? Well, um, you know, I'm a lot younger, and um, my older brother wasn't really into music beyond really my age level. He's only a few years older. My parents didn't really turn me on to much rock and roll, a few things. So I wasn't exposed to Yes at an early age. So many fans tell me stories about, oh, well, I had an older brother that turned me on to it. And so I actually didn't discover Yes till I was in high school and really um, expanding my awareness of most arts and different things at the time. So I was really exploring music and I came across Yes that way, but rather indirectly, meaning I caught them off the radio first, Owner of a Lonely Heart. That was the big thing at the time I was in high school. Um, but then I went back, I explored, you know, the history of Yes. And it's kind of funny because I went from 90125 to Tales from the Topographic Oceans. <laughs> and I thought, okay, the name of the band's the same, the voice sounds the same. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's almost like 9125 is like this entertainment magazine you leave through, and then like Tales is like opening the Bible for the first time. So it, it took me a while, but I got it, I was persistent. And then of course I fell in love with it and have related to it since. So hmm. I really think it's just in my DNA. And suddenly you wanted to play those songs yourself. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, this was this came later. I went through a lot of musical exploration, doing other styles. I was a bass player primarily, sometimes a background vocalist. Knew I had the higher voice, but didn't really develop it. Um, and then later in my life, maybe it was about 2000, I guess 2006, I wasn't involved in any projects. There was really a lack of musical involvement. So um, I wasn't involved in anything at the time and found a Yes Tribute Band for lack of, you know, projects being involved in. I thought this would really be fun as a hobby, purely as a hobby, just for fun. So I thought, well, okay, this would be a chance to try singing. I know I have the voice for it. Didn't know how far I could go with it, but it, it panned out. It worked out rather well. The problem is, is the name of the band was Roundabout. Great bunch of guys, very talented. The problem was is we never rehearsed quite enough. Um, there's a lot of tribute bands in, in the United States. That's a popular thing. But Yes isn't really a practical tribute act. <laughs> in that it's so complex and you really have to be involved in it. It's, it's a lifestyle kind of band. We would have to set up quickly and you know, of course our guitars have all the arsenal of guitars and, and it was always this sort of haphazard thing we'd throw together, never quite rehearsed enough. So it was really a challenge and I gave up on it after a while. Um, then I joined Glass Hammer, an original progressive rock band out of Tennessee, very much in the yes vain at the time, but of course they've been around years and years, so they've done all kinds of progressive rock music, but at the time they were looking for a John Anderson style vocalist. So I fit right into that, and that's really was the beginning when I got serious and started developing uh, my personal style, because we were composing. And then um, that went on for, well, it's still going on, it's just a studio project, but Basically, Yes discovered me off of seeing a video online or hearing some sound bites of what I was doing with Glass Hammer. So that was the very long-winded answer to your simple question. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so Yes heard about you uh, playing in another, another band. Right. Tell me about the day that you received a phone call or an email. Yeah, it was uh, Paul Silvera, our manager, that first called me. 
and he just explained the situation and that there would be no audition when I asked, well, when will be the audition? There will be no audition, I was told. <laughs> because the tour was already planned, they didn't want to back out of it, an Australia, New Zealand, Japan tour. And so I had about a month to prepare. And, you know, it's still kind of like hitting me now the full impact of it. Because at the time, I just went into survival mode, meaning, okay, my life is dramatically going to change now, at this moment, and I have to get things in order, and I have to prepare, and it was just this very practical kind of state of mind to get through it. It wasn't like I was really soaking up the glory of it, because I just had to get focused quickly. So th there was no doubt that you you were going to do it, right? Right. Okay. And you see, I'd sung so much of the music before, so that gives you a lot of confidence. You know, I'd I'd done a lot of groundwork. I'd laid that work already. Mm. Then now, being a part of the Yes for mm. for two years, how's that been? It's great. Uh, again, I, I'm still. Um, fully realizing what that means now. It's still unfolding. Because now I've, you know, it's in chapters. Now I've done an album with the band. I've contributed equally with them in a creative setting. And there's all the anticipation we share with that. And we're just getting to know each other better as friends. And it's, it's unfolding. It's still very exciting and rewarding.